Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration, and information on writing, publishing options, and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint, and lots more information at thecreativepen.com. And that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 470 of the podcast and today I have a fantastic interview with Nir Eyal about how to focus and be indistractable, something we all need to be if we want to achieve our goals this year. So that is coming up. Now, in my personal update this week, I have been doing the back matter for audio for authors. So this is a really interesting writing for audio little tip. And uh, this, yes, there is a chapter on writing for audio in the book, uh, but audio for authors has a lot of references. Now, in a, an ebook or a print book, you can put the references within the chapter and, uh, you know, people can find them that way. But with an audio book, if you want it to be whisper synced, which is a certain percentage has to match the text, then you have to reframe things. And so I've put all of my back matter in the appendix and have reframed quite a lot of the material within the book in order for it to be read aloud more easily. So I am really writing that book for audio. What's also fun is I already have about three chapters I need to update because either my own practices have changed or uh, new things have happened since even since I sent the book to my editor. So I have also been updating some pages on my website and uh, I'm continuing with my site audit. I'm been doing a lot of admin, accounting, you know, all the stuff you sort of put off over the Christmas and holiday period. And then you realise you're running a business and you actually have to go do some of that stuff. <laughs> so I think, you know, you're probably feeling the same way. We're really into the new year now. No more excuses. We have to get on with things. And in fact, uh, I would like your help with something that I haven't done for a few years, actually. Uh, that is a survey. So the Creative Pen Survey 2020. So essentially, I want, as I'm part of, I'm doing this site audit, site revamp, and uh, looking at old material and wondering whether to update that material or whether to just, uh, you know, redirect things and, and not even bother because people don't need that. And sometimes I think, um, well, because I've been doing this for quite a long time now, over a decade, sometimes the things that I have in my head are not necessarily what is in your head. <laughs> so even though I have redone things like successful self-publishing, that's like on the fifth edition for ebook and the second uh, print edition, the first audio book edition. <laughs> but uh, I would really like to know what questions you have so that I can can serve you better and make sure that I'm doing the best I can, both with the website, but also with this podcast. Like, what are the topics that um, you want more on? Now, so obviously, some topics, you know, you cover once and then you update them regularly, but others are more interesting to delve into. So please help me by going and doing the survey. It's essentially some just some questions around what your questions are, go to thecreativepen.com forward slash survey 2020. Links in the show notes. So that's just uh, survey S-U-R-V-E-Y 2020-2020. So thecreativepen.com forward slash survey 2020. And if you complete that before the end of the 31st of January uh, 2020, you can be in to win the top prize is going to be 60 minute one on one consulting session with me. <laughs> and you can have a whole year to redeem it. So it's not like you have to uh, have questions ready right now. But yes, one on one consulting over Skype. So you can be anywhere in the world. Um, and I, you can't even buy these consulting sessions with me anymore. I used to do them, but I haven't done them for years. So uh, you can be in to win. I'll do a random draw on the 1st of February and we'll pick one winner for that one-on-one -on -one consulting. Three runners-up will get signed print books of their choice. So, uh, and there is a special section in the survey about the podcast. So you guys can give me feedback, anything specific about the show. Right. So yes, thecreativepen.com forward slash survey 2020 before the 31st of January. 
Right, so thanks for all your emails and tweets and comments this week. Just a couple of things. Bethel's blog says, thank you for the reminder that focusing on our health is the most evergreen action artists can take. Uh, and was feeling less than enthused about trying new treatment plans for two of my many chronic conditions, but now I'm allowing myself to hope. And uh, really good to hear that. And I, in fact, am just back from the gym where I was lifting more weights. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm just loving it. I'm strong. I was. I actually did um, an interview the other day on the QWERTY writing uh, podcast and um, which I talked a lot about these sort of affirmations around my, you know my affirmation has always been well for the last decade I am creative I am an author and now I've added in I am strong because that just motivates me so much uh, every time I think about it and strong can mean so many things in many different ways but I am strong is, is one of my new ones and I talk about that in that show uh, I'll link to that in the show notes as well. Uh, Gladys Strickland says, uh, my biggest aha moment was when at the Creative Pen talked about intellectual property assets. Gives me a new focus for 2020. Glad you discovered uh, IP, Gladys. I, I remember when the penny dropped for me around intellectual property assets as well. It is a huge mindset shift and one I'm glad you've discovered. Hello to new listener Erin Dion, who says, after a decade as a traditionally published author, I just discovered your site. <laughs> I love all the info. I'm now addicted to the podcast. I'm considering some hybrid projects for 2020. Thank you, Erin. And this is what's so incredible about when you feel like you've been doing stuff and talking about stuff for many, many years, and then suddenly people arrive and they just find you. So if you're feeling like, oh, well, no one knows who I am, you know, I put out my first book or my second book and no one knows who I am. Well, this is the truth and the reality of what happens with content, whether that's a podcast, a blog, books, uh, all of these things. It takes time for people to find you. Sometimes it takes years. And of course, some people find you when they are ready, not when you are ready. So you might be, yay, I'm here, I'm talking about this stuff, but people will find you when they are ready for that information. And just a couple of thank yous. Thanks to Alex, who saw a print edition of Successful Self-Publishing at Swindon Library in the UK, which I love. And in fact, this week, I also sold 15 copies of Successful Self-Publishing to a bookstore in Michigan through Ingram Spark. And um, this is these are two examples of the importance of publishing print wide because uh, libraries and bookstores don't buy your print on demand books on Amazon. They uh, want them through uh, Ingram. And in fact, I could have done those 15 copies to the bookstore cheaper only slightly cheaper, like maybe $5 cheaper through Amazon author copies. Um, but the bookstore specifically said, no, they wanted to order through Ingram. And uh, this is these are the politics of book selling as well as the discounts that we can give people. So just wanted to point that out. And thanks to Alex for letting me know. And also thanks to Anthony, who sent me a lovely Christmas card from Oregon, which just arrived. <laughs> and I realise it's quite hard to find my physical address. So we're I do get physical cards. I appreciate it. Uh, right. Oh, yes. And finally, Vanessa, who commented quite a few comments on the Choose FI show from last week. Uh, Vanessa said, I love this podcast. I'm FI. I'm financially independent. Uh, index funds are smart. The sooner we start saving, the better. Compounding over years cannot be duplicated. Absolutely. Oh, wait, one more. I also wanted to point this out. These are all my lessons this week uh, embedded in comments. Connor Whiteley says, always amazed by the power of content marketing. Your travel podcast convinced me to get your arcane audio box set and I loved the books. I didn't know that I liked thrillers. I'll definitely be buying more. And I wanted to share that because uh, I started Books and Travel in order to try content marketing around people who might like my fiction. And this is evidence that has actually worked. So uh, I don't know if Connor actually listens to this show, <laughs> but just fantastic to hear that. And I'm actually going to put that quote in my book, I think, because it's it's kind of evidence that this type of long tail content marketing leads to book sales. But the thing is, there's no way for me to measure which sale that was um, or how long these things take. Uh, you just have to put stuff out in the world and trust that eventually it will uh, help you. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
So today's show is sponsored by draft to digital and I will play a word from the lovely Kevin Tomlinson in a minute. Also to say that I do use draft to digital for publishing to Nook and also library sites. So we mentioned libraries before. Uh, libraries are a huge opportunity for indie authors, especially at the moment because traditional publishers are pulling back from libraries and there's all sorts of shenanigans around libraries. Um, it, this is a great model for indies because it is free to your readers and we still get paid on the paper check out model or the librarian might even buy the ebook. So if you publish wide, you can have your ebooks and audiobooks in libraries. And I think this is a big push we should all be doing. So what all authors who are wide should be doing is saying, hey, readers, you can get my books for free at your local library. Please go in and request my books from the librarian. That will then get those books into the catalogues and uh, more people will then discover them and you will get paid uh, per checkout or by sale. Now, I think this is a hugely underserved niche and we're going to talk about it later on this year, but I hope that we can all do this. And if we all push for our own favourite authors in libraries, this will help. So this type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing of the show. But my time in creating the show is sponsored by my wonderful patrons. Thanks to everyone supporting the show on Patreon. Uh, I really do appreciate your support, like the tweets and emails. It demonstrates you enjoy the show and want it to continue as we head towards 500. <laughs> so thanks to the, all of those who've been uh, supporting me for many years. And also thanks to new patrons this week, Rosie Slosek, Takiri Herath, Felice Hardy, Luke Stevenson, John Svensson, Renee Hietting and Carol Gino. And also those people who prefer to stay anonymous. Anonymous, I'm very grateful. So on Patreon, you can support the show with just a couple of dollars a month. And I will be doing the Q&A uh, very soon. And you get that extra monthly Q&A if you are a patron, plus all the backlist. So if you'd like to learn more about uh, all this stuff, you can um, and have your own questions answered. You can join the show, support the show at patreon.com, p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash the creative pen. Right, let's get into the interview after a little word from draft to digital Hey, this is Kevin Thompson with draft to digital and we love libraries. Everyone at draft to digital first discovered a love for reading at their local library and chances are you did too. That's why we've put a big focus on building up library distribution for DDD authors. With a catalog of library distributors that reaches thousands of public, academic, and business libraries all over the planet. Overdrive, Biblioteca, Baker & Taylor, Hoopla, we just keep adding new ways for you to reach library patrons everywhere. And we're including new ways to make some money with innovations such as cost per checkout, a royalty structure that lets libraries check out as many copies of your books as they need, helping you reach eager patrons and get paid as you go. Find out more about how draft to digital works with libraries and you at drafttodigital.com slash library dash pricing. Nir Eyal writes, consults and teaches about the intersection of psychology, technology and business. He's an entrepreneur, investor and author of Hooked, How to Build Habit-Forming Products and now Indistractable, How to Control Your Attention and Choose Your Life. Welcome to the show, Nir. Thank you so much. Great to be here. Oh, it's great to have you on the show. So first up, tell us a bit more about you and how you got into this area of behavioral psychology because it's super interesting. Yeah, so my experience comes out of industry. So I uh, helped found uh, two tech companies, and the latest of which was at the intersection of gaming and advertising. And we founded that back in 2007. And it was there that I had this front row seat to this rise in uh, persuasive technology, as it's called, uh, the rise of Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and WhatsApp and Slack, all of these tools that do such a good job of changing our behavior. And so I, I uh, counted many of these uh, companies as uh, my clients, many of the people who worked there were my friends and colleagues. And so I became fascinated by how they built these products to be so engaging. And uh, later on, after my last company was acquired, I had the opportunity to, to kind of codify what I'd learned 
in a hopes of of exposing and uh, democratizing these techniques so that all sorts of businesses could use software products to build more engaging products and services. So companies like uh, Fitbod is a company that uses my first book, the Hooked, uh, Hooked was the name of my first book, to get people hooked to exercising in the gym. Uh, Kahoot, the world's largest educational software, gets kids hooked to in-classroom learning. Uh, I've worked with the New York Times to get people hooked to reading the newspaper every day. So these are the kind of products I've, I've worked with with my first book, and I, I taught for many years at the Stanford Graduate School of Business and the design school there. And so that was my first book. That was about five years ago. And in the meantime, I transitioned kind of what I'd learned uh, as an industry insider to solve a new problem. I mean, you know, five years ago, the problem was that we, we were making tech that people found was too difficult to use. People would complain about how only nerds and geeks could use technology back then. And today we have kind of the opposite problem. Today, we have products that are so well designed that we want to use them maybe too much and people find them to be very distracting at times. So I wanted to take what I learned from Hooked, which was a book about how to build habits, uh, to now write a book about how to break bad habits and wanted to get to the root cause of distraction to understand whether the problem is really about our technology or is there something deeper going on? Mm. Uh, so fascinating. And I think everyone listening, I mean, there, there is this double-edged sword very much. And let's um, let's get into the indistractable first. And so the listeners are all writers. I'm a writer. And, you know, we every day we're like, we must write some words on our latest book. Uh, but so often we do end up checking Instagram or Twitter or whatever, or going down this internet rabbit hole. And I, I feel like, I definitely feel, I know people listening, we feel like it's a personal failure on our part. Like we are somehow weak and pathetic. But what you've just said there, it's kind of the tools are made to be that way. So how yeah. is this distraction, like, is it our fault? You know, how can we learn to accept it in order to deal with it? Yeah, you, you've really framed the problem so well. I, I want to start by saying that you know, I only write books for problems that I have. So, you know, when I have a problem in my life, I'll think about it, I'll chew on it. Then the next thing I'll do is I'll buy every book on the topic that I can find if I still haven't come up with an answer for myself. Then I'll read as many of these books that I can find. And nine times out of 10, uh, the problem is solved right there, right? Somebody has already written a great book on the topic. But every once in a while, in my, in my case, it's about every five years, I find a topic that I don't feel has been properly addressed. And the, the solutions that others put forth don't really solve the problem for me. So in my case, I read every book about distraction and technology, and and the, the the case being made in all these books was that technology was doing it to you, that you should just stop using technology. And I, I'm sorry, I, I, it's very hard for me to listen to a, some academic, some professor who doesn't even have a social media account telling me how I need to stop using social media. And and, and despite that fact, I, I tried it, right? I, I thought, <laughs> okay, well, maybe they're right. Maybe it really is the technology that's the problem. And I know most people don't have that kind of luxury. It's not practical to go on a 30-day digital detox and just stop using technology, you'll get fired from your job. And so I, I, I do have that luxury as, as an independent, you know, I, work, I write for myself and I tried it and I got rid of all my technology. I, I, I got myself a flip phone that only sent and received phone calls and text messages, no apps, no internet connection. I got myself a word processor from the 1990s that all it did, you can just type on it. You can't do no internet connection on it. And I thought, okay, I, I've done what these books said. I have uh, excised all of the social media accounts and internet access and Google from my life. Now I'll finally be able to write. Now I'll finally finish that chapter that I've been procrastinating on. Here I go. And then I would look at my bookcase and say, oh, you know what? I should probably do a bit more research. There's that one <laughs> book that might be helpful. Or or let me organize my desk. My desk is sort of messy here. Let me do that first. Or, or let me even take out the trash because you know, the trash needs to be taken out at some point. And I would keep getting distracted despite the fact that I had excised the technology from my life. So technology wasn't the problem. Uh, and in fact, what we see is that people tend to fall into two types of categories. We have what we call the blamers. The blamers say, oh, you see, it's the technology that's doing it to me. It's Facebook. It's my iPhone. It's, it's email that's doing it to me. Those are the blamers. They blame things outside them, themselves. Then we have what's called the shamers. The shamers say it's all my fault. This is what I used to do. I used to say, mm. oh, you see, maybe there's something wrong with me. I'm, I'm an imposter here. I'm not really, people are going to find out I'm not really good at my job. Uh, you know, maybe I'm lazy. There's something, you know, I, I, I must be, I must be broken in some way. And I would shame myself. And of course, 
That's not helpful because that just makes the problem worse. I found that the worse I felt about myself as I entered into this shame spiral, I became even more likely to get distracted to escape that icky discomfort of hating myself. Mm -hmm. So that didn't work either. And so I think the right way to be is not to be a blamer, not to be a shamer, but rather to be a claimer. A claimer claims responsibility for their actions, acknowledging that you can't control how you feel you can only control how you react to those feelings. And, you know, as you mentioned, you know, you, people think of it as a personal failing in some way. I argue it's not your fault, okay? You didn't invent Facebook. You didn't invent Twitter. You didn't invent the internet and email. It's not your fault, but it is your responsibility mm -hmm. because these tools are not going away. And in many ways, we don't want them to go away. They're wonderful. They provide us with so much value. So I think it's a much healthier approach to claim responsibility over our actions so that we can get the best out of these tools without letting them get the best of us. So it's there's no doubt that they are designed to be engaging. And of course, we wouldn't want it any other way. Should should we tell Netflix, hey, can you please make more boring shows? You know, <laughs> I, I find that I want to watch them all the time. Or or Apple, your phone is too user friendly. Please make it harder to use because I want to check it a lot. No, that's not going to happen. That's not practical. So as opposed to being a blamer or a shamer, we can become claimers in order to make sure that we do more of what we say we're going to do. And that's really the the backbone of how we become indistractable. Mm. I like that very much, actually. And I i mean, like I listen to a lot of podcasts and we're on a podcast. So everyone listening <laughs> claim that you are listening to this show. And I, I think that's something that I often do, but I do it while I'm doing other things. So uh, if I'm going to put out the trash, you know, maybe I'll listen to some podcast while I'm doing it or, or something like that. So those type of um, sort of claiming and then taking action, like allowing myself time to be distracted from my work so that I can then get back to it later. So I know in the book, you talk about this sort of idea of hacking back um, our distractions. Um, so and so maybe you can talk about how you did this. So how did you make indistractable time for yeah. your writing? So let, let's start with understanding what we mean by distraction. The, the best way to understand what distraction is, is to understand what it is not. If you ask most people, what's the opposite of distraction? They'll tell you focus, but I don't agree. That in fact, I think that the opposite of distraction is not focus, it is traction. That in fact, if you look at the entomology of both words, they both come from the same Latin root, trahare, which means to pull. And they both end in the same six letters, A-C-T-I-O-N, that spells action. So traction is any action that pulls you towards what you want to do, things that you do with intent. The opposite of traction is distraction, anything that pulls you away from what you plan to do with intent. So this is really important for two reasons. Number one, anything can be a distraction. Anything can be a distraction. If you sit down at your desk and you say, okay, now I'm gonna write, now I'm gonna focus, now I'm gonna do that thing that I was procrastinating, here I go, but let me check email first. Right? Mm. Email, in that case, it feels productive. And then I used to do this all the time. You know, I, I got to check email anyway, right? Maybe something important has come through. That's kind of a, a work-related uh, productive task, right? Mm. But I argue that if it's not what you plan to do with your time, it is just as much of a distraction, maybe worse than watching a YouTube video or playing a video game because distraction has tricked you right? When you're playing a video game, it's clear you're not doing what you wanted to do if you intended to write. But if, you, if you're checking email or doing some research, quote unquote research is what I always used to do. Let me just do that quick bit of research on Google. And then of course, an hour later, I'd, I'd been, you know, it went down this horrible rabbit hole of, of, of nonsense that I'd been Googling. You know, that is just as much of a pernicious distraction. So point number one, anything can be a distraction. Point number two, conversely, anything can be traction. So I argue that going on Facebook is no more is no more morally inferior than you know watching a football game on TV or reading a good book. There's nothing inherently evil or good about playing a video game or watching a movie on Netflix or going on Facebook. They are tools and they are pastimes and there's nothing wrong with using them as long as you are using them on your schedule, not on someone else's. Not because you got some ping, ding, or ring on your phone, or because you're feeling a need to escape your present reality, but you're doing it because you have planned to do it. And so I have time in my day for social media. It's mm. in my calendar. And I go on social media, or I check YouTube videos, or I watch Netflix films on my schedule. 
right? And it's planned for in my day. And so there's nothing wrong with it. So anything can be traction. Anything can be distraction. The next thing we need to ask ourselves is what drives our behavior? What prompts us towards traction or distraction? And two things. We have two types of triggers. The first type of trigger is what's called an external trigger. An external trigger is some kind of prompt in our environment that tells us what to do next. So this is where the pings, the dings, the rings, all of these things that tell you to either do some kind of action that leads you towards traction if it's something you wanted to do or leads you to distraction if it's something you didn't plan to do. And they're not necessarily bad, but we have to ask ourselves the central question of, you know, is this trigger serving me or am I serving it? If, if that notification tells you, hey, it's time for your writing session or it's time to go exercise, it's time for that meeting with a friend, wonderful, it's serving you. But if you're in the middle of your writing session and now you have some external trigger, some ping or ding that tells you uh, to, to check the news when you plan to write, well, now that's leading you towards distraction. So we have those external triggers and we can talk about what we do about those in a minute. Mm -hmm. But I actually wanna focus on what I found in my five years of research is the most common cause of distraction. The number one cause of distraction is not the external triggers, not the things outside of us, but rather it is what is going on inside of us. That these internal triggers prompt us to get distracted by making us feel bad. And in fact, if we wanna answer this question of, you know, Plato actually asked this question 2,500 years ago, he called it akrasia, 2,500 years before the iPhone, <laughs> he talked about how distracting the world was. And he asked, why do we do things against our better interests? If we know what to do, if we know, if we want to be successful authors, we have to write. <laughs> we have to do the work. Why don't we just do it? And the reason, if we want to answer that question, we have to go one layer deeper to ask ourselves, not only why do we not do what we say we're going to do, why do we do anything and everything? What's the root of human motivation? And from a neuroscience perspective, it turns out that what most people believe is the reason we do what we do is incorrect, that, that most people will tell you that motivation is about the pursuit of pleasure and the avoidance of pain. We've all heard this, carrots and sticks. Freud called it the pleasure principle. Neurologically speaking, it's not true. That is not why we do what we do. It's not about the pursuit of pleasure and the avoidance of pain. It turns out neurologically, Everything we do, we do for one reason, and that is to avoid discomfort. Everything we do. Uh, physiologically, you know this to be true. If you go outside and it's cold, that's not comfortable. That's not, that doesn't feel good, so you put on a jacket. If you come back inside, now you're too warm, that feels uncomfortable, so you take it off. If you feel hungry, you feel hunger pangs, so you eat, and when you're uncomfortably stuffed, you stop eating. So everything we do physiologically uh, is, a, you know, any conscious action is about the, the, the desire to uh, escape discomfort. And the same holds true psychologically. So when we're feeling lonely, we check Facebook. Mm -hmm. When we're uncertain, we Google. When we're bored, we check the news, Reddit, uh, Pinterest, many, many products out there cater to these uncomfortable solutions. So what this means is if all human behavior is prompted by a desire to escape discomfort, what this means is that time management is pain management. And that's why the first step to becoming indistractable has to be to master the internal triggers, to have tools that we can use so that when we feel discomfort, when we feel the pain of writing, and let me tell you, I'm on my second book now, it never, it, it, it never becomes something without discomfort. There's always boredom and uncertainty and fatigue and even loneliness. When we feel these things, we have to have tools in our toolkit to use to make sure that when we feel those uncomfortable sensations, they move us towards traction rather than distraction. So that's the very first step. Mm. Wow, I love that. And uh, I'm on number 33 <laughs> at the moment and it doesn't change. <laughs> <laughs> it, it still it still doesn't get any easier. And while you were talking there, I was about the avoiding discomfort. So, um, you know, sometimes like today I did, you know, I did, I did a sort of 3000 word session and I barely even looked up and, uh, you know, I was in that whatever flow state, whatever you want to call it. And I was just not distracted. I was, I was all in, you know, uh, 
and I because I knew what I was doing and I was in a comfort zone and I feel like especially with non-fiction and people listening will understand you know non-fiction sometimes you are just talking about like if you've done your research or you've experienced something you're writing up kind of what you already know but fiction I feel is so hard because we're making decisions for characters and often the character is in discomfort or in trouble but also we have to make decisions which is also an uncomfortable thing for humans to do like we like habits you know don't we we like things to to stay the same as such so that actually really helps me understand why fiction can be so much harder than non-fiction I, I want is that something that you've come up against in in your research you know, I have I I only write nonfiction, so that's interesting. You know, I I I wonder if you could so you so you elaborate for me a little bit. You think it's it's more difficult to write n- fiction because you're kind of in the head of your character who may be in discomfort. Yeah, I mean, obviously, that the whole point of fiction is to get put characters in difficult yeah. situations. So you're right, always, right. Um, but also you don't necessarily know you're making stuff up about that right. characters. Whereas, um, so you can be sitting there thinking, well, okay, well, I don't know, well, where do they live? Or where are they going? Or what does yeah. this place look like? So you've got far more decisions to make about the material. Whereas with nonfiction, um, it's like you said, you did five years worth of research. And then when you're actually writing that up, sure, you're checking things, but you kind of know you're not making it up anymore. It, it, That's it's, so interesting. It's so based on research. my, uh, my nonfiction author friends and I always talk about how much easier fiction authors have it because they can just make it up. <laughs> and we always say, wow, wouldn't it be great to be a fiction author? Because as a nonfiction author, everything we say has to be based on facts, which means we have to do a lot of research, right? We have to, <laughs> we have to go dig up a lot. You know, we can't just say something. We have to see, you know, that was there peer reviewed research? Was the research any good? Has it been, uh, uh disputed since? It's so interesting. So, you know, maybe were, the lesson the here is, is that greener. it's all hard. <laughs> yeah. It's all difficult. Uh, and, and the big picture lesson here is, you know, managing that discomfort, no matter where that discomfort comes from is is a superpower, right? That is the macro skill here to become indistractable, to do what it is you say you're going to do. Let, let's even go outside the realm of, 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 of writing when it comes to, you know, why don't we exercise if we say we will? Why don't we eat right if we say we will? Why aren't we fully present with our kids, with our friends, with our family? Uh, wh- why don't we do what we say we're going to do? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an ever-present question. I think it's a fascinating question. And it all comes down to impulse control. It mm-hmm. all comes down to what do I do in response to discomfort? And, and the important point here is I'm not saying that discomfort is bad. In fact, quite the opposite. I think a lot of people in the personal development, self-help industry, they, they try and sell this notion that feeling bad is bad. And, and I couldn't disagree more that in fact, you know, our species has been gifted this ability to do something that no other animal on the face of the earth can do, which is to see into the future better than any other animal. No creature can predict what is going to happen like we can. And so what that means is fundamentally that no matter what potential distraction we might face, the antidote to impulsiveness is forethought. Let me say that again. I think that's probably the summary of the entire book. The antidote to impulsiveness is forethought. We have no excuse to continually be distracted by something more than once. So Paula Coelho said that a mistake repeated more than once is a decision. And I think that's so true because in my life, I would continually get distracted again and again and again by the same things. And now that doesn't happen anymore. If it happens once, okay, you're human. But if you keep getting distracted by the same thing, whether it's, wow, this is really hard, I'm trying to escape, or uh, this ping or ding keeps distracting me, another person keeps interrupting my day, I don't plan my day properly, whatever it might be, you know, continually getting distracted by the same thing again and again becomes after a while a decision. Now we have no excuse. It's something that we are doing to ourselves. And the antidote is always forethought. It's planning ahead. If you if you wait till the chocolate cake is on the fork, you're going to eat it. If the cigarette is lit in your hand, you're going to smoke it. And if your cell phone is right next to you when you wake up first thing in the morning, you're going to check it before you even say hello to your loved ones because that's too late. Now you're depending on self-control and willpower. And we know the research tells us that self-control and willpower don't work. What works is a system, is steps, is tools that you have in place to deal with distraction before it even occurs.
Mm. Well, let, let's just give some specifics. So I, I like you keep mentioning uh, pings and dings because that drives me absolutely nuts. And I personally have everything turned off. Um, what I do have, though, is, um, and I got this because of the health issue, because as a writer, you know, you get this terrible posture. Um, and, and when I do get in the flow, I, I forget to stand up. So I've got this Apple Watch, but it doesn't ding. It just kind of vibrates slightly when I need to stand up. So that is the only notification I allow myself um you, and and I need that for health reasons so um that's something I've done also like the email uh one of the biggest things I did this year was get an email uh manager an inbox manager and I know that's not um right for everybody but in my business that has made such a difference because I just can ignore email knowing that someone else is dealing with it so what are a couple of things that how you does that do? work by the way I'm, I'm curious I don't I don't go into that in depth not that it's not a terrific solution it sounds mm-hmm. like it's working for you but can you tell me just a bit more about that what is an email manager how does well, that work it's um it's a company called inbox done uh which is uh, by my sort of online mentor yarrow starrett and essentially it's another person who manages my gmail inbox um for my main business email so she mm. goes in there every day she's an american so she's an american hours and um she will answer because you know i get lots of uh, i have a writing website obviously and i get a lot of questions like how do i self-publish a book and mm. i was just getting so annoyed every day answering questions that the same, same question ones. over and yeah. over again um and i have certain things with patreon and i i had all these repetitive tasks that right. were driving me nuts so to remove but they had to be done because i was serving people um right. but uh by having somebody else to do repetitive tasks it freed my time up to do more things like writing um yeah. so that's that those are a couple of examples in in my life so uh, what are a couple of your examples of of ways that you make sure this gets done yeah, that, that sounds like a terrific technique. I'll, I'll give you some of the techniques that I recommend. There's, so there's j- just so that, the, you know, the most important thing here is the strategy, not the tactics. But I do want to go into the, some, some of the tactics, but I just want to emphasize, you know, tactics are what you do. Strategy is why you do it. So the most important thing you can get from listening to this podcast or if you eventually read the book, it's this framework, these four parts that involve becoming indistractable. So step one is about mastering the internal triggers. Step two is about making time for traction. Step three is about hacking back the external triggers, and we'll get to that in just a minute. And then step four is about preventing distraction with pact. So that's the the four big strategies. Now, there's lots and lots and lots of tactics that fit under those that I talk about in the book, but I just want to make sure people know that it's not as important to focus on the tactics because you can customize the tactics, discover your own tactics, read a bunch of tactics online, but if you don't understand why these things work, then they're ultimately not going to work for you because you won't be able to adapt them to your particular situation. So given that, let's dive into the the third step, how to hack back external triggers and specifically this question of email that, you know, plagues many of us. And in my case, you know, writing my first book was relatively easy and distraction free because nobody who knew knew who I was. (laughs) I was, I wasn't getting any emails or very few. I wasn't getting, you know, these speaking and consulting engagements that, that I started getting once my book started selling 250,000 copies, you know, then it be, I became someone that people reach out to. And ironically, the thing that made me successful prevented me from doing the one thing, one, I really enjoy doing. And two was what made me successful in the first place, the writing. And so it was really a bad situation. It's a big reason why I wrote Indistractable was because I was kind of a victim of this success. And I knew if I wanted to continue my career as a writer, I had to figure this out. So let me give you what what one of the techniques are in the book for mastering these uh, this email inbox that, that plagues so many people. Um, the technique I'm gonna describe has been shown to reduce the time you spend on email by up to 90%, 90%. And here's how it works. The idea here is that when you look at time studies of where people waste time on email, it's not where you think. People think they waste time on checking and replying. That's not where the time wasted on email goes. The time wasted on email is wasted, not on the checking, not on the replying, but on the rechecking. That's where we waste time on email. What does this look like? In my case, I would open an email, read it real quick, put it away, open it again, put it away, open it again, put it away. It's the checking and rechecking because we forget what's in the email, so we touch each email way too many times. So the rule here is that each email, you only touch twice. The first time you open that email, you need to ask yourself one question, and that one question is the most important question from a time management perspective. It is, When does this email need a reply? 
okay? Not what do they want from me, what's the contents, no. When does it need a reply? And now you've got a decision to make. If it never needs a reply, just delete it, okay? It, or archive it. If it needs a reply right this minute, your house is on fire, you have to answer this email right away. That's about 1% of your emails that are actually really urgent. Go ahead and reply. But that's you know about 1%. The rest of your emails, 99% of the remaining emails, are gonna fall into two categories. Emails that need a reply today and emails that need a reply sometime this week. Now, what I want you to do is to label each email with one of those two labels. And if you don't know how to use label settings, just Google it. It's, there's all kinds of instructions on how to do it, no matter what your email service provider might be. Uh, everybody has labeling built in. So you wanna label it with either today or this week. And then you wanna make sure that you have time in your calendar to only reply to the emails that you marked today in your calendar. So you have time in your calendar, reply to urgent emails, and you're only replying to those emails that need a reply today. It's gonna to be about 20% for the average knowledge worker. 20% of your emails actually really do need a reply sometime today. Then you have a different time blocked out in your calendar. For me, I have a three hour block every Monday. I call it Message Mondays. When I go through all of those emails that can wait a little while, but then you're saying, well, how does that save me time? Aren't I just putting off the inevitable? Here's a magic trick. You can make emails disappear by making, by making the recipient wait a little bit, okay? <laughs> it's amazing, try this. If you just let emails simmer for a little while, okay, not, not the ones that are urgent, of course, the ones that are really urgent, you'll reply to today, about 20% of your emails. The other 80%, it turns out, you can reduce that 80% by half or more just by giving them a little time to wait. Why? Because people figure out their own questions. They, uh, they, they, the, what was urgent then is not so urgent anymore. Somebody else chimed in or it just got crushed under the weight of some other priority. And you'll find that many of those emails that needed a reply actually didn't. <laughs> and, and furthermore, if you reply to those emails in a solid block of focused work, as opposed to replying, you know, whenever you get these emails, you'll be much more efficient. You'll be at your desk, you can process them much quicker, and you can fly through those emails that need a reply sometime this week much quicker than if you just uh, replied whenever you got them. Because here's, here's the formula. If you want to receive fewer emails in a given period of time, you have to send fewer emails in a given period of time because people play this email ping pong game. They think, oh, I got an email, that means I gotta return it. No, you don't, you don't have to return it immediately. You can wait when you return those emails. And that's, so that's just one technique, this labeling technique. Mm. There's about a dozen others that you can use as well that I describe in the book. Mm. No, I think batching is definitely a superpower. I, I use Google Calendar and I, you know, pretty much batch everything. Uh, so yeah, all of those are, are great and organizing things in advance. Now, the, the book is fantastic. It's really useful. It's got lots of stuff in, but I do want to change tack a bit because from what I've read about your publishing journey, I believe you self-published the first edition of Hooked. I did. Um, yes, you did. So, but, And then you got picked up by a publisher. So I wonder, you know, many of my listeners are, um, I'm an independent author. I run my own publishing company. Uh, many uh, listeners are indie by choice, but also are hybrid. So they do a bit of both. Um, so maybe you could talk about your, your publishing journey and, and why you went indie and why you, uh, why you switched. Yeah. So let's see. So with uh, Hooked, I I, pub I self-published because I, I didn't really have any other options at that point. I, I'd never published before. Uh, I had a blog with about 5,000 email subscribers at the time. And I figured, you know what? I, I just want to write this book for myself. It was a, a question I had in my mind. And so I just thought, you know what? I'd make a little PDF. I'll self-publish it. I'll put it on Create Space. If anybody wants a print-on-demand copy, they'll they'll get one. Well, uh, after I did that, um, the book started getting some momentum. And, and when I had about 100 five-star reviews on Amazon, I started getting phone calls from publishers saying, hey, you know what, what, what's the deal with this book? You, you know, are you thinking about professionally publishing it? And I think what happened was that the book was kind of de-risked, that uh, publishers, you know, they, they want winners, right? They want books that they think can sell a lot of copies. And so because the book was starting to get so many good reviews, um, the, the question of, well, is there demand? Is this book any good? Was kind of removed from the equation for a publisher. So there was no skin off their back. They, they already saw the book was good. They didn't have to believe me or my book proposal. I actually never wrote a book proposal for Hooked. The customers were speaking and it turns out that there was demand for it. So we ended up taking the book off the market 
republishing it professionally with, with portfolio and uh, and then you know off to the races and and since we've sold about a quarter million copies and counting um and so that's that was the story of of hooked mm. so then did you uh did you then go the sort of straight traditional route for the second book was that you know was that part of the the deal almost so once you'd done the one book they were like right you're off I, I will say it's a lot easier on the second book. <laughs> the, the second time around was was definitely a lot easier. I mean, the the first time I didn't even I didn't even try because you know the it, the advances didn't really they were I didn't I wasn't in a position where I needed the advance to write the book. I wanted to write the book first and foremost, and then see what what to do with it next because I was just thinking out you know a few of my blog subscribers would would get it and maybe it'd be helpful for them. But I mostly wrote it for myself. And I actually did something very similar with Indistractable. I, I I don't like the pressure of, you know, here's a bunch of money. You better write this book or else we're going to take that money back away from you. I mm. wanted to write the book first, uh, take my time on it, do it, do the best job I possibly could, and then sell the book. And so that's basically what happened with Indistractable. I was, you know, I had a, 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 a probably a third draft at that point. I was happy with it. I knew it was going to be a book I I would be proud of. And by the way, it had happened many times before that I'd, you know, start writing a book and say, this is, this is rubbish or somebody else already wrote a book that was much better than I'm going to be able to do. So let's drop this project. And I'm so glad I didn't sell those books to a publisher because then I would have made something I'm not proud of as opposed to my methodology. And again, I'm not saying this should be everybody's, but I, I really like, uh, my freedom and autonomy. And I didn't want to feel like I was you know, on the hook for something that I may not be able to deliver uh, it, a product that I'm really proud of. And so I, I you know, was about 80% done with Indistractable when we put in a proposal and uh, my agent then went to, to shop it around and uh, we ended up going with with more tra- the more traditional route as opposed to the self-publishing route. Mm. No, I, I know freedom and independence resonates with my audience. <laughs> so um, I have one more question for you because we're almost out of time. So this is going out um, on the show in early 2020. So we're at the beginning of this new decade and there's lots of kind of discussion of what is going on. So I just got Wired magazine today, which has Zuckerberg on the front, you know, what is going on with Facebook? Is big tech going to be broken up? I feel like we're on this knife edge of um, the good and bad aspects of social media. So you've talked about very much it's not the fault of tech. um, And we love tech, you know, I'll fully commit to saying I have my phone next to my bed. (laughs) Um, You know, so what do you think is, you know, and obviously no one can tell the future, but what are your thoughts around this sort of knife edge between the good and the bad side of social? Um, Are we going to see big changes ahead in social media uh, in the coming years? So it's 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 a great question. I think everybody's watching this closely, and, and I want to be very clear. I'm not a tech apologist. I think that they have a lot of things to account for when it comes to you know data incursions, there are these companies' monopoly status, political interference. Uh, these companies have a lot to account for, and I, I think they're showing that. Right? They've spent billions of dollars, literally billions of dollars, uh, I- I fixing these problems uh, that 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 are uh, that we see from these platforms. And so it's not that I say that these companies uh, are lily white. No, no, quite the opposite. Um, but I think when it comes to this particular problem of is technology addicting us all, is it hijacking our brains, that's baloney. It's not scientifically true. Uh, clearly, many things are potentially addictive. It's not that I'm saying that it addicts no one. It clearly addicts some people. But addiction is a pathology. And just as some people uh, get addicted to alcohol, the vast majority of people do not become alcoholics, right? Not everyone who drinks a glass of wine with dinner is an alcoholic. And clearly not everyone who uses email and Facebook or Instagram or or Twitter is an addict. So we we really need to stop using that term. One, because I think it disrespects people who actually have the pathology of addiction, but also because I think it's very disempowering because it places blame on the pusher, the dealer. That's why we love this terminology of addiction, because it frees us from responsibility. And I'm here to tell you as an industry insider, I mean, my first book was about how these products are built. I can tell you these tools are good. These techniques that they use are effective. They're not that effective, right? (laughs) That you are way more powerful than you think. It's only when we adopt this mindset of they're doing it to us, they're controlling our brains, they're addicting us. That's a very convenient excuse for someone who doesn't want to take personal responsibility and do something about the problem. So I've written this 250-page book to tell you how to stick it to Facebook. 
to tell you how to stop using these tools if they're not serving you. I don't want people to keep using these tools. I want you to stop using these tools if they don't serve you. But if you find that, you know what, in some ways, in some contexts, they're great, uh, then, then I want you to keep using it in a way that serves you as opposed to you feeling like you're serving them. Mm, fantastic. So you are more powerful than you think. That is a good place to uh, finish. So where can people find you and your books and everything you do online? Sure. So my website is nearandfar.com, but near is spelled like my first name, N-I-R. So that's nearandfar.com. And if you want specific information about the book, it's indistractable.com is the website. And uh, there's a free complimentary 80-page uh, workbook. We couldn't fit into the into the final edition, but it's there for you. Uh, you don't have to buy anything to get it. Uh, but if you do end up buying the book and you, there's a special form on indistractable.com on that website where if you put the order number, I will uh, give you access to a free video course as well. So check that out at indistractable.com. Brilliant. Well, thanks so much for your time, Nia. That was great. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. So I hope you found the discussion with Nia useful as you begin to focus on what you want to achieve in 2020. What is the one thing that you could change in the week ahead that will help you move in that direction? So coming up next, this week I have an in between episode, which is a discussion between me and Orna Ross about the trends for authors in the 2020s with a little bit of an introduction as well. Uh, this was first broadcast on the Ask Ally podcast, and I will also be adding in a bit of extra stuff and expanding the show notes. Also, just a reminder to go and please fill in my survey, the Creative Pen Survey 2020. Um, go to thecreativepen.com forward slash survey 2020 and be in to win one-on-one -on -one consulting with me. You cannot buy this. Uh, you can only win it. And I'm not scary. <laughs> I'm really nice, honest. So if you'd like to, um, I try and be helpful. <laughs> If you'd like that consulting or be in for a chance to win the consulting, just go fill in the survey, thecreativepen.com forward slash survey 2020. Right. Happy writing. I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time. <laughs>